Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I feel like it's my birthday, because not only did I find a creationist video to respond to fairly quickly, but the host of this late night talk show style video is dressed like this. And that's not where it ends, because his guest is an engineer named Flanders. Flanders. This video just makes me so happy in so many ways, which actually says a lot about me, come to think of it. Quick, roll the title card before I have an existential crisis. And we're live at Smarter San Diego. It's Derek Evans here, your host. And my special guest today is my good buddy, Rick Flanders. Rick. Stupid Flanders. Stupid Flanders. Welcome to the studio. Thanks. Terrific to have you here uh, to talk about the big question. The big question. Is there a color combination that could possibly clash more than that? Maybe add a bright yellow shirt into the mix? I recently uh, took a class at seminary where we talked about and discussed creation. Um, it was mostly in, in, it was in an apologetic setting. So the concept was to try to help people from atheism to theism, essentially. In my experience, that's not really the purpose of apologetics. Apologetics seems to be more about helping people who already believe but are having doubts to ease their doubts. I have yet to see an apologetic that is more than superficially convincing, especially when they try and get scientific. The philosophical ones tend to do better than the scientific ones, because they get to play tricky word games rather than having to misrepresent scientists. Because any scientific style proof of God or proof against evolution almost universally relies on misrepresentation. But um, listening to some Ray Comfort, taking class at seminary really opened my eyes. If Ray Comfort opened your eyes about evolution, then your eyes have not actually been opened about evolution. That just shows that you must have not had a very good understanding of evolution before you took his class. Also, Ray Comfort is basically real-world Ned Flanders. So by extension, we now have Flanders talking to Loud Suit Guy about Flanders. Which is that, uh, first, first of all, it... If you think about it, it's impossible that we're even here. Is it, though? Doesn't the fact that we are here demonstrate that it is indeed possible that we are here? Yeah, I know that's the whole point. It's impossible that we are here, but we are here, therefore God. But that argument doesn't work until you actually demonstrate the impossibility of our existence. And at this time, there are just too many unknown variables in that calculation for us to say conclusively one way or the other. But the fact that we are here is pretty good evidence that if we ever do figure out all the variables, we will find that it actually is possible for us to be here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's impossible that we're having a conversation. You know, uh, if we started at dirt, which everyone agrees, scientists, uh, uh, all religions agree that uh, everything started as dirt. And that's how you know that he doesn't know what he's talking about. I am unaware of any science that concluded that life started out from dirt. Now, since you are saying that life came from dirt, that must mean that you're going with the definition of dirt that excludes anything living, so not the kind of dirt you would plant a flower in, just some form of crushed up minerals. While it is true that life uses some of these minerals, life did not come from these minerals. Life is a chemical process. If you want to find some proto-substance that it came from, you might say life came from water, as water is the solvent in which biological reactions occur. But even then, water creates problems for prebiotic chemistry because of how quickly certain necessary molecules break down in water, so it has been proposed that life may have started out using formamide as its solvent. Either way, no scientist that I am aware of that isn't a creationist would be willing to agree with the statement, all life came from dirt, except perhaps in a purely metaphorical sense. And uh, somehow dirt became us. No, somehow the first living organism formed. After that, it's pretty well understood, though certainly there are more unknowns the farther back in time you go, as would be expected. It's kind of hard to get a picture of what the first life looked like when that first life almost certainly wouldn't have been able to be fossilized in any way that would enable us to find it. One thing is certain, though, the first organisms did not look like dirt. 
And just to backtrack a bit, you said that other religions say that we came from dirt as well. And that's just not true. I mean, there might be some out there, but there are several that don't. And you implied that they all do, therefore they agree, therefore there's some truth to it. Well, the Hindu creation story has Brahma getting lonely after creating the universe out of a lotus flower that grew from Vishnu's belly button, then splitting himself in two to make male and female from which all humans descended. No dirt. The Celtic people believed that two gods, Don and Danu, were permanently locked in a loving embrace from which they could not be separated, which trapped their children. One of the children killed his father and cut him into nine pieces, which became the various aspects of the world. Danu found a red acorn seed from which Don was being reincarnated, and watered it with her tears. The berries from the oak tree fell and grew into the first humans. So, again, no dirt. Egyptians weren't terribly concerned with the creation of humans, but one of their myths had humanity being the result of a tear shed by the eye of Ra in a moment of weakness. Now, all this isn't all that relevant, but the point is that there are lots of religious stories about where humanity came from that have nothing to do with dirt. And it got to the point where um, uh, we're, we're having a conversation. We, uh, so what I'm doing is I'm forming an image in my mind and I'm using symbolic language to uh, convert what I'm seeing in my mind into symbols which are going, in my, I'm moving my mouth, and those symbols are going through the air. They're going into your head. They're vibrating in my eardrums, right? <laughs> which is then being transferred into information in my brain, yeah. which and then I'm immediately saying it back to you. I mean, what we're doing right now is insane. Yes, the processes in our brains that are responsible for language and cognition are amazing. But being really complicated and amazing does not make it impossible. Th that's the most complex thing in the universe. Well, I'm glad to know that you've explored the entire universe so that you can confidently say that the human brain is the most complex thing in it. Now, perhaps instead of arguing for creationism on a real estate guru's talk show, you could maybe share the technology that allowed you to explore the universe with the rest of humanity so that we can use it too? Or is that just another unfounded assertion? And uh, so I'm an engineer. I do robotics, automation. Yep, because when you want to present a case that goes against the overwhelming scientific consensus in biology, the engineer who builds robots is clearly the guy to talk to. <laughs> but Rick, if given enough time... Yeah, given enough time, a lot can happen. It's been a few billion years since life started. Humanity has only been around in its current form for about 300,000 years. That's only about 0.0067% of the total time the Earth has existed. All of recorded human history only goes back about 10,000 years. Our whole culture is not even the blink of an eye compared to how much time has passed. We built the pyramids, colonized just about every nook and cranny of the dry spots of our planet, explored the deepest parts of the ocean, and went to the moon, all in a minuscule sliver of time. Now just imagine what could happen given a few orders of magnitude more time than we've already had. Right, so this is where this is where we need to look at Dar Darwinism or Darwin's theory uh, of evolution. Why would we be looking at Darwinism if you want to learn about the modern theory of evolution? In any scientific field, we would expect that progress would be made after 160 years of study. Seriously, Darwin's theory of evolution was completely groundbreaking, but it's 160 years old now. If you want to understand evolution as we understand it today, maybe look at the theory of evolution rather than Darwinism or Darwinian evolution. I just pulled this from Wikipedia just a few minutes ago, and I know that the actual theory is more complex than this. Yes, the actual theory of evolution is more complex than Darwinism, which is the Wikipedia page that you pulled this quote from. Fun fact, if you actually read through that whole Wikipedia page, it spends a lot of time talking about how creationists have used the word Darwinism in order to present a false picture of evolution. All species of organisms, this is basically describing what Darwinism is, all species of organisms arise, arise and develop through the natural selection process, okay, of small inherited variations that increase the individual's ability to compete, survive, and ultimately reproduce. Also called the Darwinian theory or Darwinism, it originally included the broad concepts of transmutation of species. This is also referred to as a change of kind. Only by creationists. 
Transmutation of species is an outdated term that mostly referred to Lamarckian-style evolution, where an organism would acquire traits throughout its life that would assist in its survival, and it would pass those traits on to its offspring, thereby gradually changing into another species. In evolutionary biology, we're moving more toward a cladistic system. The Linnaean system of kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species isn't quite working anymore. The reason being that you don't outgrow your ancestry, so organisms don't jump between categories as was once thought. As such, the Linnaean system results in really complicated naming systems that aren't always indicative of evolutionary relationships, and we have to stick in extra categories where things don't quite fit properly, like suborder, superorder, subspecies, and stuff like that. The more we learn, the more categories we need, and it's getting to a point where it's unwieldy to say the least. So uh, when you look at class, order, genus, species, kind... I like how you snuck kind in there after species. You know that's not a scientific term, right? No creationist has ever successfully defined it. Does that mean that your definition would put it as being more specific than the species level? So not only did Noah have to have African elephants on the ark, he also had to have Asian elephants since that's a separate species and must therefore also be a separate kind? The change of kind um, or of evolution, which gained um, <clears throat> general scientific acceptance after Darwin published on the origin of species in 1859. So it was 1859 when this originally was accepted. Now, it was 1859 when it was originally published. It took years after that before it would become scientifically accepted. Publication does not equal acceptance. Now, sure, some scientists jumped right on it immediately, like Thomas Henry Huxley, but it wasn't really accepted in the mainstream until about the 1870s. And even then, it was mainstream for English-speaking countries. It took a bit longer to work its way through the rest of the languages. Um, so this is a long time ago. Science came a long way since. Which then begs the question, why are you reading about the old, outdated version of the theory if you are aware that it's old and outdated? Um, I think that the understanding of, um, of God has come a long way since 1850. There's been a tremendous amount of discoveries. Name one. What is one advancement that has happened in the understanding of God since the 1860s? In my experience, most of the modern versions of any apologetics or theologies are just rehashings of what theologians and philosophers said in the Middle Ages or before. I'm not saying you're wrong, I'm just not aware of any serious God discussions that don't have their roots in something older than 1860. So <clears throat> when we look at this, we have to take it with a grain of salt to the extent that in 1859, things were a lot different. You know, you could avoid that whole problem by discussing the modern theory of evolution. There's even a handy dandy link to that Wikipedia page just 12 words before the spot where you chose to start your quote. It's even in the same sentence as your quote. So if you wanted to go somewhere where you didn't have to take it with a grain of salt because of how outdated the idea is, you could have done that. The fact that you chose not to is very telling. This was sort of a groundbreaking thing. What did Darwin do? Darwin observed birds mm -hmm. um, on different islands who originated in the same place and then changed in the different places that they went to over long periods of time. That was one of several things Darwin did, yes. But there was a lot more to it than that. He made observations about species and their adaptations all through the course of the Beagle's five-year mission. But the Galapagos were definitely the most influential in the development of his theory. The reason being that they are geologically young. The oldest of the islands is a mere three million years old. Being volcanic islands, they obviously didn't start off with life on them, so life must have come there from the mainland at some point, with Ecuador being the closest spot on the mainland. Sure enough, when studying the various species, Ecuador's life seemed to bear the closest resemblance to that found on the Galapagos, and each island had its own slight variation on the theme. But Darwin had not yet made the connection to evolution and natural selection at the time of the voyage. In fact, when Darwin returned to England after the voyage, he had to have help from ornithologists and herpetologists in identifying the Galapagos species that he had misidentified. And since he had not yet figured out geography's effect on natural selection when he was actually at the islands, he had failed to even record which birds were found on which islands. It wasn't until Darwin met with ornithologist John Gould that he started putting the picture together. Gould not only pointed out that several birds that Darwin had labeled as varieties of the same species were actually distinct species, but he also informed Darwin that 25 of his 26 land birds were new to science entirely and appeared to be unique to those islands. So the finches were an important discovery, but it was not quite the eureka moment that it is often made out to be or that's what it appeared to be. And so, based on that, now what really happened though was their beaks changed. Yeah, 
their beaks changed. Beak characteristics that did not exist before developed. They changed over time. The alleles that were responsible for the beak characteristics changed over time in the population. Evolution. Right. They had different beaks. So what we have to realize here, and this is said, it's in bold. And by the way, I didn't put this in bold. Wikipedia put this in bold. Darwinian theory. Yep, theory. And the fact that you don't seem to understand that theory in science refers to a collection of facts, data, and laws that explain some observed phenomenon shows that you have a rudimentary understanding of what science even is at best. Something doesn't become a theory in science until we know that it is true. Sure, there will be aspects of the theory that are not understood, but such is the nature of science. If we understood 100% of everything relating to cell theory, we wouldn't need biologists continuing to research the inner workings of the cells of various organisms, because we would already understand how they work. Okay, it's a theory that was based upon the changing of beaks of birds. That was a part of it, but it was far from the only observation. There were five general observations that were supported by various specific observations that Darwin made all throughout his five-year journey. First was that more offspring are born than ever survive to become adults. Our Danios probably laid hundreds to thousands of eggs, and it looks like four will survive. And one of those four is a runty one that probably would not have stood a chance if we weren't specifically caring for it. Second is that among these offspring, there is variation. Of the four surviving Danios, they are not identical. There is a range of values for their different traits. Third is that this variation extends to all traits, even those vital to survival. Fourth is that the offspring compete within their environment for food, resources, mates, and safety. Those with the more favorable combination of traits have a better chance at surviving than those with a less favorable combination, with the favorability of any given combination being dependent largely upon the environment. Those that survive then pass their traits on to the next generation, and the process starts over. These are the five general observations that Darwin made as a result of his voyage, and these observations, once put together, are what helped him formulate the theory of evolution. Sure, the finches were a part of it, and they are an easy example to use now, especially since we have observed the speciation process happen with these very finches in the wild, but you presenting it as though that were all that Darwin had is disingenuous to say the least. So let's just know that that is where it began. Now, his theory is that change of kind or transmutation of species, that because he witnessed that the beaks changed, which is an adaptation, that is not a change of kind. Adaptations lead to a change in species. It's not really that hard to understand. Organisms change over time. You know this. You've said as much. What you have failed to do is explain how they stop changing. Where is the limit to the change? In the finches, it's not just the beaks. We have changes in coloration, food source, song, size, mating habits, and more. If all of these traits keep adapting, where do they stop? By what mechanism are they stopped? But what he's saying, and in the Darwinian theory, is that the transmutation of species, or a change of kind, means that that bird will one day become an elephant. It means nothing of the kind. See what I did there? What it does mean is that one day, in the sometimes distant future, the descendants of the original Galapagos finches will be very different from their ancestors. This has already happened. The original finches that ended up on the islands probably looked more similar to Caribbean or South American finches. But from what was almost certainly a small number of ancestors, the Galapagos finches diversified into at least 26 different species. So here we have an example of diversification through natural selection that is so obvious that even creationists have to acknowledge it, but it just has to stop before it gets to something we would call evolution, because reasons. That is what a change of kind means. If change of kind means transform from a bird into an elephant, then an observed instance of change of kind would conclusively disprove the theory of evolution, because that's not even close to what evolution says happens. But you provided us with this uh, very interesting graphic here today, which says, in case you can't read it, because I know a lot of people see this on their phones, um, at the, on, the, on the ape side, or the chimp side, it says there are millions of these. Um, on, the, uh, on the human end, it says there are millions of these. Uh, so where are the millions of these in between? If that graphic was provided by Flanders, then that just goes to show that he also has a really bad understanding of the theory of evolution. Chimps did not turn into humans. 
Humans and chimps share a common ancestor. We don't know exactly what it was, but it probably looks something like Nyanzapithecus. So there currently are millions of chimps and millions of humans, but there are not currently millions of Nyanzapithecuses. Nyanzapithecai? Nyancat. Thereby showing that picture to be fundamentally flawed. No real shocker there. But the thing is, we actually do have a hard time reconstructing the timeline of the great ape evolution. But not because we don't have enough fossils, it's because we have too many. There are so many that it's difficult to determine relationships based solely on morphology without any genetic data. But yeah, you have a cute meme, so I guess you win. Yeah, you would think that uh, if if uh, we came from paramecium to human. Why would anyone think that the progression was paramecium to human? A paramecium is a protist, which is only incredibly distantly related to anything in the rest of the eukaryote category, and almost certainly is not ancestrally related to humans at all. Were you just using a big impressive sounding science word to try and trick people into thinking you know what you're talking about? How catechistic of you. Well, there's no evidence of mutants. You have chimpanzees, you have people. Mm -hmm. Well, since nobody is claiming that chimpanzees evolved into people, that is entirely expected. But what we do have are a bunch of different species that clearly show the progression of hominids toward the humans that we know today, with some of the transitional species even still being around today. Uh, there are a few, uh, you know, uh, that look intermediate, uh, but you know, they could be, uh, it could be argued that they are on one side or the other. Exactly. Two different experts can look at one specimen and each could argue for it being on one side or other of an arbitrary species line that we have drawn. There is still argument today as to whether Homo habilis should be reclassified as an Australopithecus instead of a human because it's got characteristics that stick it in both categories because it is transitional. So where are, where are all the wings that don't fly, you know? Flying fish, flying snakes, flying squirrels, none of which actually fly, but have rudimentary gliding apparatuses. Not to mention the flightless birds like penguins, ostriches, chickens, and whatnot. Uh, where are all the intermediate um, mutant uh, mutations? Uh, you know, you have, you have uh, beautiful children born every day. They, they seem perfect, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Except when they aren't. Extra fingers and toes, missing fingers and toes, webbed feet. Hell, the ability to digest lactose into adulthood is still a minority mutation, and I could go on. Uh, there's every, every part of the child is useful, it has a purpose. So the reptile muscles that are in fetus hands in humans that eventually just go away before birth are useful how? What about the muscles that try to turn their ears towards sounds but are too weak to actually do it? Those are useful? You still have those as an adult. Did the recurrent laryngeal nerve loop through the aorta for some specific function that couldn't be accomplished in a more efficient manner? There is plenty going on in every body that we could all just do without. They will say, yeah, we have, we've done it in a petri dish, you know, this bacteria has, has, has transformed into this. The, ch the bacteria never became a human. It never became a rat. It never became, it, there was no change. Of it's still bacteria. Yeah, the mm -hmm. bacteria adapts. Um, it definitely, it can even mutate in certain uh, situations, circumstances, but it never became something else. And that's mm -hmm. the problem. So the theory says that something becomes something else eventually right. with enough time. Aside from all the misrepresentations here, like the bacteria becoming a rat, Who's to say that bacteria accumulating changes that you admit happen cannot eventually turn into something else? We have seen bacteria develop traits that they are not supposed to have, like E. coli metabolizing citrate. One of the ways we figure out that E. coli is E. coli is to give it citrate and see if it can metabolize it. If it cannot, that could be E. coli because it never metabolizes citrate, except for the strain that evolved to take advantage of a new food source and now can metabolize citrate. What about when we observed a unicellular algae develop the trait of multicellularity as a survival mechanism? That's a pretty huge change, and it happened fairly quickly and remained a stably heritable trait for years after the fact. 
Would you look at a unicellular organism, then look at a multicellular organism, and say they are the same kind of organism? We've observed the development of new organs within lizards, entirely new organs to help them digest a new food source. That happened in just a few decades. If that much can happen within one human lifetime, how much more could happen over the course of a few billion years? The other problem with the theory is that, um, you know, it, it's unobservable. So the scientific method says that we must be able to observe the changes in our theory in order for them to be lockstep with the scientific method. Mm -hmm. Because these things take place supposedly over millions and millions of years, it is therefore unobservable. If I go shopping and then come back and see just a pile of smoking rubble where my house used to be, do I need to have seen the house on fire in order to determine that it burned down? Or can I maybe just look at the evidence to make that determination? Now, maybe the house didn't burn down, maybe there was a bomb planted. Well, if that's the case, then the evidence will look different than if it were just a fire. Do you need to have seen the event happen in order to tell the difference between a pile of rubble that just burned down versus one that blew up? So it does not fit the scientific method. So the most widely accepted theory of science does not meet the scientific method standards. Well, in your words, it is the most widely accepted theory of science. Now tell me, if hundreds of thousands of scientists can all agree on this one theory, scientists, a group of people who are known for vehemently disagreeing with each other and nitpicking all the minor details trying to expose every last flaw of each other's work, if they can all agree on this one thing, does that maybe say something about how well evidenced that one thing must be? Maybe, just maybe, these people who spend decades of their lives studying all the tiny details of evolution understand something about it that you, a real estate guru, do not. So rather than assuming that you know better than the collective body of scientists for the last 150 years or so, you should maybe show a little humility and try and figure out where your understanding is lacking. Right, and yeah, so over time, thing, what we observe is things decay, you know, entropy. The, the universe is becoming more chaotic, not more ordered. Well, actually, it has been proposed that the development of life happened because of entropy. Life creates entropy faster than non-life. Living systems are better at capturing energy from their environment and dissipating it as heat than non-living systems are. Therefore, the development of life is expected, as the systems will trend towards arrangements that increase entropy more efficiently. So not only does evolution not violate the laws of thermodynamics, the evolution of living systems is an expected consequence of the laws of thermodynamics. And uh, if you talk to evolutionists, they will say, well, we don't know how dirt came to life originally. So they call it uh, abiogenesis. So they leave that question off the table generally. But that's like the biggest part of the whole thing. Is <laughs> if you think that's the biggest part of this whole thing, then you've missed the point. Abiogenesis is a very important question, yes, but it is not a part of the theory of evolution. You can believe whatever you want about abiogenesis. How the original life form came to be is irrelevant to the question. The evidence points unfailingly to the diversification of species being the result of a gradual evolutionary process. You can quibble all you want about how we don't know where the first life came from, but that is ultimately irrelevant. Now sure, it is a very interesting question that scientists would really like to know the answer to, but that's kind of the whole point of all the origin of life research that's going on now. So we don't claim that we know things that we don't know. We only claim to know things that are demonstrated by the evidence. And yet creationists still pick on the areas that we admit not understanding and claim that this lack of understanding somehow invalidates the rest of it. Right. Well, what would that what would that dirt have to like what qualities? You know, the dirt would have to be able to reproduce. Yep. Somehow, right? Uh, what other things? It would need it would to have to survive. Survive. It would have to live. Yeah. Survive, reproduce. It would have to uh, eat something, so it has to have a digestive system. A mouth organ of yeah. some sort, or, you know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so by your definition, in order to count as going from non-life to life, it would have to be something that reproduces and metabolizes. I'll even be generous and add mobility to the list so that it can seek out food. Well, 
Protocells have been put together in a lab using only five relatively abundant chemicals that do all these things, thereby demonstrating that it is possible. That's it for this one. I skipped a lot of their stuff, but they were just hitting on the typical creationist talking points that you would expect from someone that came out of the Ray Comfort School of Apologetics, including comparing self-replicating systems to inanimate objects like cell phones. Today's comment of the day comes to us from a bunch of you, who pointed out that Newton did not believe in the Trinity when he was brought up by Carl Kirby as an example of a Bible-believing Christian who was important to science. That's a good point. Creationists love to point out all the Christian scientists throughout history, but they usually forget to mention that almost all of them were of denominations that would get them excluded from the term Christian as creationists use it today. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, especially Mark McManus, who are the dirt that evolves into my channel. If you'd like to change things up over time, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!